Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and this is Stew's News, a review of American high-speed rail happenings over the last month. In this September 2023 episode, we'll be looking at what went down during August. Let's start with Texas Central and the biggest news of the last month. Amtrak announced it would be entering into a partnership with Texas Central Partners with the aim of helping them figure out how to move the project forward. The exact nature of this partnership is not totally clear at this point. However, we know Amtrak will be helping Texas Central Railway with various federal grant applications that will move the project into public partnership territory. They are looking at Chrissy grants, which would be small time grants, usually aimed at safety and grade separation. They're looking into the corridor ID program since Houston to Dallas is currently not part of either the Gulf Coast or the South Central High Speed Rail Corridors. That would help grease the wheels for future Federal Railroad Administration funds. And lastly, the Federal State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail Grant Program, which is the program where every other inner city rail program in the country gets to fight over the NEC's scraps. This year, the NEC pot is $9 billion, and the entire rest of the country gets $4.6 billion. Naturally, the group Texans Against High Speed Rail is against this. They're calling for the 1,500-page environmental impact statement, which received a record of decision three years ago, to be redone as a completely transparent means of continuing their tactic of attempting to stall the project into oblivion. You also have the group Reroute the Route, which has a list of demands, including using only existing rights of way and no federal or state funds. This would basically kill the project. These groups favor an Interstate 45 route, but this is not useful within 65 miles of Houston, and the geometry doesn't support high speed within 65 miles of Dallas. These groups simultaneously stall the project and complain it's not being built fast enough. They also opine that it will lose money and need taxpayer subsidy while supporting a route that would be 40 to 50% slower and that much more likely to lose money. I'm not saying area residents don't have legitimate concerns, but the goal of these anti-Texas Central Railway groups is easily deduced. The positive is that high-speed rail as a subject is back in the news in Texas and the discussion continues. Last month we talked about the Fort Worth to Dallas project, a minor addendum to that news, North County Department of Transportation is hoping to have the environmental review for that done sometime next year. Speaking of continuing the discussion, let's move on to California High-Speed Rail. Governor Gavin Newsom appointed Benjamin Belknap to the California High-Speed Rail Inspector General position. This is an office created by the legislature last year. Hopefully this means an end to free tractors, school buses, community centers, and exorbitantly priced tree planting programs as supposed carbon offsets and environmental justice. I added a reference to a pretty good article on the subject of Inspectors General from last year in the description. Now let's take a look at the June numbers from the August Finance and Audit Committee meeting. Capital Outlay Budget Summary finally pushing out some dollars. $255 million expended in June. Remember these Finance and Audit Committee numbers run two months behind. This right here is minimum pace to keep phase one as a whole ahead of inflation. On the flip side, some of that was not spent efficiently as we see they chewed up $207 million in risk contingency in June. If that's a blip, not a big deal. Their average from March to June was 62 million a month. That would keep them going for two and a half years. However, if 207 million continued regularly, they'd be over budget again in nine months. Here's a sampling of change orders from Construction Package 4, 
Hmm, let's see. Out of sequence work. Out of sequence work. Interim adjustment to completion deadlines. Additional costs due to delays on vacations of Kern County roads. Well, there's three million of your tax dollars up in smoke. Of course, that's nothing to the 16 million for interim time extension on CPs two and three. But to be fair, that was probably due to all the flooding up there. For whatever reason, the contracts on two structures were 40 million over combined. Reasonable to assume that was flooding as well. Speaking of CP4, here's the earned value chart. Last month, the chart indicated they were behind schedule. Same here. Last month, the trend line predicted construction completion getting pushed from August into next year. Performance is improved in June, but that does not improve the trend line. Northern California Regional Director Boris Lipkin was recently on a live panel and stated that this package was within weeks of completion. How many weeks? Didn't say. During the board meeting, it was stated CP4 would be substantially complete by the end of September, so we'll see next month. General progress on all packages one mile guideway was completed and progress was initiated on one structure. They've been putting out a press release for every overpass they build of late and are claiming seven structures complete in 2023. I'll wait for the official data from the finance and audit reports, but that would be more than shown here. The California High Speed Rail Authority submitted some grant applications in August. Of note is a $230 million mega grant request to help pay for the Merced station. The California High Speed Rail mega grant applications from last year were rejected. So we'll see how this one goes. The board approved the request for qualification in regards to train sets. This initiates the train set procurement process. The authority is currently anticipating that it will choose its train set contractor around this time next year. No other major developments for California High Speed Rail, so let's move on to Brightline West. Of course not Brightline West, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the delay of the opening of Brightline Florida to Orlando. It was supposed to launch on September 1st. So far they're offering tickets for the 15th, so might only be a couple week delay, but they haven't made an official announcement. I think once that's open, they'll be able to concentrate a little better on getting Brightline West started. Also with Brightline Florida, the issue with the St. Lucie Bridge we've been talking about seems they've worked out a reasonable temporary solution with the Coast Guard to keep trains from getting delayed there too often. They're also now officially planning to replace that bridge. The new crossing would eliminate 80% of current conflicts with watercraft. Now on to actual Brightline West news. Political support is lining up behind the project as each applicant attempts to put their best foot forward ahead of the decisions for the Federal State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail Grant Program. Those judgments are expected to come down next month, although I've seen some sources predict November. Before construction can start, Brightline West has one more hurdle to surmount, and that is surface transportation board approval. Brightline is currently seeking a couple of exemptions to the STB certification that would allow them to be construction ready ahead of the Department of Transportation's funding decision. Presumably the logic is that this would give them a leg up on the competition or in the case of California High Speed Rail, put them on more equal footing. Total funding for the inner city passenger rail grant is $14 billion over a five year span with about 4.6 billion of that available for this fiscal year. As pointed out in this article, it's possible a request could be fully funded over multiple years. On the California side, the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority is building a rapid bus line between Rancho Cucamonga and Pomona. This would provide a direct transit connection from the future Brightline West 8th Street station to key area destinations like 
Victoria Gardens, the Ontario Mills Mall, Toyota Arena, Ontario International Airport, and the Ontario Convention Center. The bus line would terminate at the Pomona Transit Center, providing access to a Metrolink line the 8th Street Station is not on, further expanding transit-only access. Now let's see what's happening with Acela and the NEC. Amtrak announced 25% completion on the Portal North Bridge. This bridge will replace the current movable bridge over the Hackensack River in northeastern New Jersey, about six miles from Manhattan. The new bridge will be fixed span with sufficient clearance to avoid all interaction with watercraft. Max speed over this crossing will be increased from 60 to 90 miles per hour. Construction started in 2022 and completion is expected in 2027 at a cost of $1.8 billion. According to Amtrak's monthly report, Acela and NEC regional routes continue to perform above forecast for the year and at an operating profit. Acela accounts for about one half of the NEC's operating profit, despite only accounting for one quarter of the ridership. I also just want to point out with this sheet, you can see the large majority of Amtrak's operating loss is from the long distance routes, which are meant to act as subsidy to underserved rural areas. Keep that in mind whenever anyone says Amtrak doesn't make money. Amtrak has started bus service from Worcester, Massachusetts to Providence, Rhode Island in order to create a transit connection from the city of 210,000 to Acela and the NEC. With that, let's wade into Cascadia high-speed rail. Similar to Brightline West, politicians from Washington State are lining up behind the Cascadia Ultra High Speed Rail project to facilitate reward of $198 million requested via the Federal-State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail grant program. They sent a letter to Mayor Pete asking pretty please for the money. As discussed in last month's Stu's News, the Washington Department of Transportation would use this money to perform yet another study so they can finally decide if they want to move into the design phase of the project. The good news is that after much work last year, they now have the bureaucratic structure in place to receive the, and process the reward. Look at you, Chicago Hub, making me eat my words. I tell you, some of these projects look like they're going to slip beneath the waves for a while, but they manage to hang in there. Continuing with inner city passenger rail grant lobbying season, several agencies within the Chicago Hub network join in as well. They are looking for about $870 million to help out with the Chicago Hub Improvement Program. This program represents foundational work that would eventually bring true high-speed rail to the area. This includes unlocking some of Union Station's dormant potential and reactivating a means of connecting Union Station to the Rock Island, Canadian National, and Metra Electric rights-of-way. This would avoid bottlenecks on the existing routes through the Chicago Metro to the southwest, this is key to developing much faster routes out of Chicago to the south, which would facilitate the potentially high-speed green lines here on this high-speed rail alliance graphic of an inspirational Chicago hub network. Not coincidentally, the work planned for the $870 million represents two of the four critical rail projects in the Chicago area identified on the High Speed Rail Alliance website here. The improvement plan also includes double tracking 16 miles of Amtrak's Michigan right-of-way that should improve travel times between Chicago and Detroit by as much as half an hour. That would get Amtrak Wolverine service up to an average of 55 miles per hour, which is obviously still a long way from high-speed rail. And now it's time for Stu's Boo Boos, where I cover everything I missed last month. Well, this is new, no Boo Boos. 
we'll have to introduce a new element to this game, the Silver Star. I get one every month. There are no boo-boos. Five gold stars for you, one silver star for me. Can you keep the gold ahead of the silver? Come on, boo-boo hunters, I know you're out there. As always, if you find any boo-boos in this presentation or something I missed before posting this video, point it out in the comments. If it's a good one, you win a prize. More Federal Railroad Administration High Speed Rail Corridor videos on the way, more High Speed Rail City Pair videos, and of course another Stu's News in five weeks at the end of September. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big, beautiful freeway.